I always want to jump ahead before the series announcement comes up because it is a little awkward standing here just waiting. <laughs> but um, as Chris mentioned, Pastor uh, Randy and Deb are celebrating their daughter and son-in-law's marriage vow renewal this weekend. And what a testimony of how God restores marriages, family. God is a God of restoration. And so we celebrate that fact with them this morning. So we're going to continue on in the series, Suit Up, Empowered by the Spirit, Equipped for Victory, uh, with a message about the shield of faith. And honestly, I told the people in pre-service prayer, that if we could have just recorded what we prayed and then just played it here this morning, oh my goodness, <laughs> you would get what God wants to deliver this morning. So I'm just praying I don't get in the way of that because prayer was so, so powerful. And I want to invite you guys to join us. I, I told you every time I'm up here, I'm going to promote uh, pre-service prayer, because it is so powerful. And if you uh, are shy about praying in a group or you feel like you don't know how to pray, it's a safe place to come and pray. And guess what? You learn to pray just by being around other people who pray. And as Shirley pointed out in prayer this morning, everybody's voice counts. Everybody is different. You don't have to pray like me. You don't have to pray like Surely you don't have to pray like Tom. You pray with your own voice because God has created you to have relationship with him too. <clears throat> so, you know, I don't know if you guys remember a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Randy was encouraging us to bring our Bibles and to, good job. <laughs> And so I am going to encourage you to turn to your Bibles as I read Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 17. And that is our key scripture as we have been going through this message on suit up. I'm going to turn there. So Ephesians 6, 10 through 17 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And that's what we have been, this series is about. Each piece of the armor of God has been taught on so that we can wear it. And as we wear it, we are able to stand against the enemy. We are able to stand strong in who God has created us to be. So put on that whole armor, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of peace, above all, taking up the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Wow. God has really equipped us with quite an armor that we can wear to uh, protect, be protected. And this morning, we're going to talk about the shield of faith. And notice in the scripture that I just read out of uh, Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, that verse 16 says, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. I like the way the Passion Translation states it. It says, in every battle, take faith as your wraparound shield, 
for it is able to extinguish the blazing arrows coming at you from the evil one. So I want you to really, that's pictorial language. I want you to picture that. As we take up our shield of faith, it's a wraparound shield. It doesn't just protect in one area. And if we only use it to protect our mind, we leave our hearts wide open. If I only use it to protect my front side, my back side is open. If I only use it to protect my heart, then my mind, my body, everything is exposed. And so faith is really a protection, wraparound protection that protects our mind, our thinking. It protects our heart, our emotions. It protects our physical body all the way around. So if I wear that shield of faith, I become protected in all ways. And when we wear faith as a wraparound shield, our mind, heart, and body are protected from any direction and any way in which an attack would come. And just how does the enemy try and attack us? Through disease in our bodies, through financial struggles, through divisiveness in relationships, through emotional trauma, and ungodly mindsets, and that's just to name some of the ways. But when we wear the shield of wraparound faith, those fiery arrows <clears throat> cannot penetrate to the point of, dev of devastation. They are extinguished. God promises us in his word that he will enable us to walk through any trial, any temptation, any circumstance or situation in life and come out victoriously because we wear the shield of faith. So just how do we wear the shield of faith? First of all, we have to know what faith looks like. Faith in the New Testament is defined as conviction, confidence, assurance, trust, and reliance in God and all his ways. So we must know what God says in order to trust and rely on him in all ways. And knowing what he says comes from reading our Bible. And when we read our Bible, we learn what he says about himself, what he says about us, what he says about other people, and how we're to interact with other people in the world around us. And I want to, as a side note, encourage you guys how important it is to read your word, to be in the Bible. Because if you don't know what the word says about God and who he is, how can you trust him? Because faith is trust, isn't it? You really need to be in that word. <clears throat> so some people think that if they put their hope in something, that means they're operating in faith. But hope and faith are two different things. Hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. Faith is a confident trust something will happen. So let me state that again. Hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. Faith is confident trust something will happen. So hope and faith are very different things because God is asking us in this hour to move beyond hope and step into a greater faith. He's looking for people who know what he says and will stand firmly in the place of confident trust in what he says in order for what he says to become manifested reality. You can't pray for a situation to change and hope that it will simply change by remaining in a place of hope. You have to engage your faith. So here's an example. Charlie comes to me and wants prayer. He has a physical ailment in his body that he's wanting healing for. So if I pray a prayer that sounds something like this, God, Charlie is sick and he needs you to heal his body. I sure hope you will do that for him. How effective do you think that prayer is? 
Hope is not going to heal him. Yes, God is sovereign, and God can even use a hopeful prayer and step in and do it. But if you pray a prayer based on what God says in his word with a confident trust that what he says is true, then you're acting in faith, and it is faith that moves mountains and will release the manifestation of God's presence in that situation. So a faith-filled prayer would be something like this. God, your word tells me that you have the ability and the desire to heal Charlie. I choose to put my trust in your ability and desire to heal Charlie, and I speak health and healing to his body through the authority that you have given me as your daughter to speak to this mountain of disease so it is removed. What kind of prayer do you think pleases the Lord? The first prayer or the second prayer? I think it's the second prayer. You know why? Because that comes out of spending time with him and knowing what his word says. And intimacy with the Lord always releases a manifestation of his presence. Not that hope and faith don't work together, because they do, and we know that from Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 declares, 11.1 declares, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Greek word for substance in that verse literally means the standing under, and it was used in the technical sense of title deed. The root idea here is that you stand under a legal claim to a property that you legally have in order to support that right to be on that property. So faith is the title deed of things hoped for. We stand under the title deed of faith in order to support the validity of our faith. When I'm praying for Charlie's physical healing, of course I'm hoping he'll be healed. But that hope has to stand under the claim that healing is something that God desires to do and has the ability to do. So the concept of faith, according to his word, entails the understanding that all of creation, visible and invisible, is the direct result of creator's intelligent action, and it is not produced by blind chance. Sometimes we think we're operating in faith, but we're merely hoping that there is a blind chance that the thing will happen. Hebrews 11.3 states this clearly. It says, faith empowers us to see that the universe was created and beautifully coordinated by the power of God's words. He spoke, and the invisible realm gave birth to all that is seen. So faith empowers us to see into the invisible realm and agree that what is there in the invisible realm will be manifested here in the visible realm because it is what God has spoken or is speaking. Faith has to be the foundation of our hope. And Hebrews 1.11 states that. Now faith brings our hope into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we hope for. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. So faith is required in order for the unseen to become reality. God is the one who empowers our faith, and we are to lean into his ability to make something happen, not our own ability. And that's called surrender. We surrender our preconceived ideas, plans, and as we do that, we trust in his ideas, his plans, and his timing. So remember last week when Naomi shared about her desire to have a natural childbirth because they want more children. And she was trying different things to help move that along. 
And the Lord clearly spoke to her saying, I am Yahweh and I will make it happen. Naomi had to come into a place of surrender and trust that he was the one who was going to cause the outcome to be one of victory. That's faith. She moved from a place of hope into faith. Yes, Naomi had hoped for natural childbirth, but when she shifted from that place of hope to faith, what she was doing was putting her confident trust in what God spoke to her. I am Yahweh, and I will make it happen. And she had the victory, didn't she? Natural childbirth and a beautiful baby boy. Big baby boy, nine pounds, three ounces. Woohoo! <laughs> so, the good news is God is the one who activates and empowers faith, but we're the ones who must allow that activation and empowerment to take hold and grow. If we look at each and every one of the heroes that's listed in Hebrews 11, we see it was God who initiated a faith in them, but we also see they had a responsibility as he activated that to say yes to it and then to stand in that place of agreement and trust that what God said and promised would happen. And I'm not going to go through and read Hebrews 11 to you this morning, but I am going to encourage you in your own devotional time to read Hebrews 11. Because as they became empowered to remain in that place of faith, they anchored their hearts and their minds on the promises that God made to them. They trusted God, and they had confidence in what he had promised. And when God initiates a call to faith, he has a purpose for doing so. And I, like, again, I'm not going to read Hebrews 11 to you, but these purposes are listed in Hebrews 11. And let me just share what Hebrew 11 uh, catalogs as some of the purposes of faith. Faith will empower us. It will subdue kingdoms. It will produce works of righteousness. It will shut the mouths of our enemies. It will quench the fiery attack of the enemy. It will produce strength and weakness. It will help us to overcome. It will cause us to receive the dead back to life. It will produce deliverance. It will produce freedom. And it will produce God's kingdom advancement here on earth. Wow. I don't know about you guys, but I want faith activated in my life. Faith does not look at what we can see or touch or feel in the here and now. Faith positions us to look forward and to understand there is something greater than what we are experiencing right now in the moment. You know, as Naomi was in labor, she decided to trust God that there was something greater that God was doing than what she was experiencing in the moment. And what she was experiencing in the moment was a lot of pain. And guess what? As she looked to the greater, the greater happened. And again, the miracle of natural childbirth and a healthy, big baby boy. (laughs) But there is even better news for us who are living today than those heroes of faith that we read about in the Bible. We have been given the ability to operate in a greater faith than they did. In Hebrews 11, 40 declares this great news. But now God has invited us to live in something greater than what they, the heroes of faith, had faith's fullness. Faith's fullness is now ours because we live under a new covenant. And that new covenant was cut when Jesus went to the cross, died for us and then through the power of his resurrection, was able to release to us the fullness of faith. This new covenant 
assures us that we can fully stand under the title deed or the legal right to every single promise God has made. And when we are confident in that, faith is fully operating. Just as Hebrews 11 has a catalog of Bible heroes who operated in faith, there are everyday people of faith who operate, everyday people who operate in faith today. And I've asked some of those from amongst us to share testimonies of how faith has operated in their life this morning. So, Rochelle? <laughs> I said, before service, I said, Rochelle, are you ready to share your testimony? She goes, I don't know what God's going to give me, but I know he'll give me. This woman operates in faith. She has so many stories, it's hard for her to even pick one because there are so, so many. But this woman is a woman of faith. She believes what God says. Okay, so let's find out what he's going to say. <laughs> so, okay, I'll tell you a recent one. Um, I, I work for a financial planner. And a lot of times, you know, when you have a job and it's holidays and stuff, you get little bonuses, Christmas cards, this and that, whatever. Never, not a one. So each year Christmas comes, I buy them both little gift bags with Christmas stuff in it. Their birthday comes, I've given them that. They know I'm a Christian. You know, they see my attitudes and the way I carry myself. The Lord has started having me come into work early, sit in the conference room, and just praise him. Not ask him for anything, but cultivate a relationship and a spiritual atmosphere. Because he's working on something. See, where we go impacts and makes a difference if we're just obedient. So in all of that, I'm still doing this for several years now. And I'm seeing changes because I was obedient to do something I really didn't feel like doing, especially when it comes to just prayer or something, because you really want to put your petitions before him. But God said, no, I know what your problems are. I know what your petitions are. I want you to cultivate a relationship because we've forgotten how to do that, to just awe on him. So, it's two things that's happened in the process of this. Um, his, he, it's just him and his brother and I, and my boss is a foodie. <laughs> Major foodie, isn't he, Barb? <laughs> um, so, he orders salami, and his brother had snuck and ate some and eaten quite a bit. And, and <laughs> so, he goes in to get it, and it's not there, and he's asking his brother, where's my salami? And he's like, I didn't t- t- touch it. He goes, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Tell me who ate my salami. Yes, he did. See, we set an atmosphere. We set an atmosphere by the way we walk and respond to things. And it's times that he was harsh and I had to hold my tongue. Thank you, Jesus, for the Holy Ghost. Because he's cultivating something there. I overhear him telling his, his clients, oh, I'll tell Rochelle, she likes to pray. So he's spreading the gospel and giving me the opportunity. And even in all of that, he still has not, I'm coming in with birthday gifts. I'm making bread for him, bringing that in for him and all of that. Well, this Mother's Day, he bought me a Broadville air fryer from Wilms and Sonoma. 500 bucks. (laughs) The same one he got his mother. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the point is, I had to be faithful and trust God. I had to be obedient to the things that he called me to do. I had to set my feelings aside because it's hurtful when you're constantly pouring into someone and they don't pour back to you. I didn't even get a card. We sent out 300 cards to clients. I don't even get a card. But God, he is faithful when we give him the opportunity to be. Thank you. Awesome. So Rochelle heard God, just praise. 
And in faith, she trusted he would shift things, and he did. Lisa. First of all, I got to plug pre-service prayer again. I mean, we're talking scriptures even that came up that she had in her message. Don't miss out, man. You guys are really, it's, it's really powerful. So, um, so my testimony. That's a testimony, though, because that builds faith. It did. I was sitting over there going, I don't even need to take notes because I already, like, almost know what she's going to say. That built my faith. Um, last summer, at the end of the summer, our air conditioning went out. And we were like, okay, cool, because we don't need it. <laughs> we're just going to let it go, and then we'll deal with it next year. So it's next year was now. <laughs> In the spring, uh, it was like, okay, so um, we actually know a friend of our son is in air conditioning and cooling, reached out to him, and he said, when the temperature is right, I'll come over. So he came over and looked at it, and first, the first thing he said was, this unit is really old, like over 20 years old. And I said, that's not, we didn't buy it over 20 years ago. So the first thing we uncovered was, I guess we bought an older unit, but we didn't know we bought it about 15 years ago. So he said, it's a dinosaur and they don't make parts for it anymore. So let me take a look at it. A fuse had blown. So he went and bought fuses for us. Didn't charge us anything. Like I, I, we tried to give him money and he wouldn't take it. So he replaced the fuse and put it in. Okay, and he said, I will Frankenstein it for you this summer if I can. That's, those are the words he used because they, I just, whatever, be ready to buy a new one. And they're about $6,000. So Ed and I were like, I mean, that's not going to happen. I'm just being real, you guys. That's not going to happen. So we're going along and it went out again. And Ed said, let me go check the fuses. And he went and he pulled the fuses, brought them in, tested them, and they were all fine. So we're like, okay, he's thinking, well, this is the start of the Frankenstein or something. I don't know. And I kept thinking, no, no, no. He put the fuses back in and he went out. It's around the side of our house. As he was walking around, I started having a conversation with the Lord. And I said, I just know somewhere in scripture, Lord, I said, God, someone asked Jesus if they were willing. I'm, I'm literally just talking, right? I'm just talking to myself. So I'm asking you, God, are you willing? And then I answered myself and I said, I know you are willing because we are your son and your daughter. So I know you're willing to fix this thing. And then I just started praying in tongues because that's all I could think, right? In my mind. So I prayed in tongues. Ed doesn't know he's outside. He came walking back around, put, had put it back in. And I said, why don't you try it? Why don't you start it? Turned it on. And it's been working ever since. <laughs> Woohoo! Lisa asked, is this something you're willing to do? And that's what we need to do as we stand in faith. God, are you willing? Is this your desire? And when it lines up with the word, the answer is yes. It lined up with the word. He's willing. He's willing to bless us. Is it his desire? Yeah, it's his desire to give good gifts to his kids. So let's see. ta -Nehisi. All right, so at the start of the uh, pandemic, uh, both my dad and my uh, smaller, well, smaller, my younger brother got ill. So my dad calls me and says, hey, can you take me to the hospital? So at that time, everything was really new. I said, yeah, no problem. So I came and picked him up, went to the hospital, and they let him out. Um, actually, later that day, went back, picked him up. But then overnight, Overnight, he got ill. So 
He asked me to come pick him up again. But during that period, I don't know, either I was watching the news, but everything was kind of rapidly building up. So, so at that point, the first time I was good. The second time, when I had to go pick him up again, I don't know, like a crazy fear had set in. And I was just like all these spinning thoughts of COVID and so forth. And it's like, hey, I don't really have a choice. I mean, it's my father's side. I mean, I can't just say whatever, but I mean, I was fearful. I'm not going to lie. So I was. But, you know, I said, I mean, if I'm going to die, I have to die. So I went and picked him up, went back to the hospital. So that's not really the issue that I just shared. The, the, really the fear, because that fear is me. So I just have to deal with my own fear. The part that probably shook me is when my dad says, before he got out the car, like, um, I don't think I'm going to come back home. I don't think I'm coming back home. I, I need you to take care of your mother and, my, and your brother. That's like, all right. Anyway, so, like, for the next 30 days, it was like the ups and downs of, of uh, the COVID stuff that probably more people hear about. He was restricted, so he couldn't go see him. Um, and then in the meantime, I asked my, my younger brother. So my dad didn't know, but then my younger brother got ill. And then um, he actually passed. It was quick, though. It was probably like uh, maybe a day, maybe two. And then um, anyway, so my dad was on the respirator. And um, so I was like uh, building all the calls. So I kind of became the point of contact. So I don't know. It's, I will say that I feel like I lost time. And it was like, I don't know. I was still working and doing what, whatever my daily task, but I felt that I lost time because it was just like the reality of what was going on. Because one day there would be like, hey, he's good, he's getting better, and it would drop the total opposite way. So I'm saying that all to say, um, I mean, everything isn't easy. I mean, I know we all know that. But um, so later that, during that period of time, I was actually in my backyard, and um, I was probably crying out to the Lord. Not probably, I was. <laughs> and then, uh, I mean, literally the Lord came to me. So this is a vision. So literally, I'm walking like this. I'm in my backyard. So he's standing here. And then there was angels around him. And then he was like, um, like speaking to this. And I was, like, crying and bawling and doing whatever. He basically told me to stop. So. And I will say this. The way I talk about God is not that it's all, like, warm and fuzzy. So he wasn't patting me on my back and saying all that. He just said stop. So. And he told me, he directed me to release the word to speak into this situation. So now he's, he told me to speak against fear. So I will share, like, I've never seen my father scared, literally never. So that's the part that was like a gut punch for me. So I'm speaking, I'm releasing the word. He also allowed me to see in the hospital that there was angels covering my dad. Um, Cause there was reports that the, some of the um, nurses were giving me how, um, cause I would talk to him on the phone, but they were sharing that he was scared and so forth. I do know the Lord sent his warring angels to protect them. Um, me, even in sharing this, I will say, like I know my, my wife has my back. Um, she does remind me to kind of make sure I, uh, even when I'm address saying it out loud, not that I walk around like crying all day, but uh, <laughs> when I talk about it, it comes back to my memory. So, um, And then the last piece I will say is, um, it's in Romans 8, 6. It says, for to be carnally minded, or, uh, I'm sorry, for to be carnally or fleshly minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So the carnal mind is the component of, like, we're, we're thinking, we're just trying to operate uh, out of the natural. I'm responding out of the flesh, hurt, wound, blah, 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 whatever it might be. But the Lord is saying, respond unto me. So it's spirit to spirit, heart to heart. Respond and release my word. 
So that's the kind of, I guess the last thing I want to say is the faith moment is me trusting in the Lord, being obedient, and releasing the word as he directed me to do. Hmm. Yeah, even when we're standing in faith, it's not always easy, is it? And I just want to speak to disappointment this morning because I feel like there are people here who have stood in faith and have been disappointed. I know in my own life, my sister was dying of a brain disease, and I stood in faith for her healing that she was going to be healed. And she ended up passing away. And I was devastated because I thought, God, (laughs) I thought I was standing in faith with this. And faith goes beyond that and says, I am still going to trust you, God. I am still going to put my confident faith and trust in you that you are good. And that even though she passed, I'm going to still stand in faith. And you know what? She was a strong believer. Her and I were prayer partners. And the day she died, next to her nightstand was her Bible, open, and a daily devotional, open to the day of her death. Because even though she was struggling physically, she had faith in him. And so I want to just speak to those who've been in a place of disappointment and feel like God has let them down and disappointed them. He hasn't. Because he always has a better plan. My sister's in heaven now. His dad's in heaven now. Boy, what a better place. And the legacy that she left behind and the legacy that he left behind is a greater thing. Angie. So speaking to fear, um, I will say, and faith. Faith can also be imparted. It is a gift. And when you're around people with endless, boundless faith, you cannot help but to feel that and to be brought into that too. So even when you're in a place where it's fear, it's the faith that moves that mountain so you can pray, so you can declare, so you can speak the word of God over another person. And I say that because that is the testimony for me, is that I was on a phone getting spiritual advice from somebody. And they told me, and I, I, I was just kind of in a place where I said, how do you do that? How are you fearless? And they said to me, I do it scared. And if I fall, I fall serving the Lord. There is no fear in that. See, that's the perfect love that casts out fear. Because first you have to be able to walk in that perfect love and in that faith. And then it casts out all fear. And I said, I want that. So I've been in the impact room. I've been for years, you guys have heard, social anxiety. Angie's deal battling social anxiety. In school, public speaking, FSKM, you name it. On the streets, on the train, on the plane, everywhere, right? It's like, ah. That's, that's not my portion. So I sat one day and I was praying for others. And in the middle of having faith for others, Holy Spirit said, this one comes out through prayer and fasting. And in obedience, I did so. And in that, it lifted in an instant. And I said, what was that? Oh, that's the fear that was intertwined into wounds and trauma since being a, a child. Interwoven, it's into my identity. I have social anxiety. No, that's fear. And his perfect love did that. But it was also fellowship. And it was also pouring out my heart like water before the Lord with someone who had faith and said, no, you do it scared. 
So if you have anxiety, that's fear. Fear has no place because where, where faith says the mountain is moved, fear has you running from the mountain because it's bigger than anything else and you don't want to approach it. But you go to that mountain and you speak to it. And if you have to go hand in hand with another who speaks for you, you will then know the testimony of faith because you didn't do it alone. And then when it's time for you to go to the mountain, you know how to speak because you watched another with faith do it. And that is the cloud of witnesses that we have. But he loves us so much that he gives us another to say, speak your testimony because we overcome by the blood, that perfect blood and the word of the testimony. And I needed to hear her testimony. So I knew that that was my portion because the Lord wants to heal. He wants to heal. He wants to bring faith into the situation. Whether it comes out my way or not, I'm going to do it scared because there's no fear anymore. And it is lifted in the name of Jesus. And that is the testimony. Woo! You think she has social anxiety about standing up here anymore? I don't think so. Woohoo! <laughs> All righty. And uh, Ed, if you could queue up, we have a, a video from Drew and Kate. Hey guys, Drew, Kate, and Donnie here. You missed you. Uh, yeah. We'll see you guys soon, but for the meantime, you get us through video. So here's a little uh, testimony of faith. So we were asked to share testimony of faith, and a lot of you guys know the uh, my story of trying to get pregnant, and it wasn't really possible without God. And to really shorten that up, um, God is amazing, and through a lot of faith, and just God's loving kindness and him always being faithful, we were able to conceive. Um, and so God is so incredibly good. Um, the other part of the testimony that we kind of want to focus on today is that's really on our heart is Donnie was born at 33 weeks. And for those of you that don't know, full-term pregnancy is 40 weeks. So I went into the hospital with severe preeclampsia and it was just a, a surprise. They told us that we weren't leaving until Donnie was born. And because of how early he was, we had a lot of pediatric specialists coming in and basically telling us, uh, one, that he would be a NICU baby because he was so early. And because of that, um, they also told us everything that they expected him to have or to struggle with. Uh, they really set the expectation that Donnie would probably not leave the NICU until his due date, which was I went into the hospital on the 18th of April. Donnie was born on the 22nd, but his due date wasn't until June 7th. So that would have been a significant period of time. And we just didn't receive it. Um, we just let them talk and say, you know, thank you so much for the information. Uh, we just know that God is good. And so we're just going to keep praying. Yep. And uh, he ended up staying in there for about 15 days. Yep. So way quicker than June 7th. Yeah. And uh, he uh, he was hitting all the milestones. The only area he was a little deficient was in being in the car seat and breathing, which he, he was fine with after obviously 15 days. But yeah, uh, yeah there was the other part of it, that the main yeah. part of the testimony. Yeah, so one of the things that they continued to say that we didn't really share with anybody because we just, we were pressing in um, is that, a lot of the times when the nurses would check him or the doctors would check him, that Danny would have a heart murmur. And throughout the the days that he was there, they finally had a um, pediatric cardiologist come in and do a complete evaluation on him. So after her testing, uh, she found that the she was almost positive that the lining and the muscles around Danny's heart on the right and the left side were thickened. And so she said that, that that would lead to diagnosing potentially with a congenital congenital heart defect or cardiomyopathy, which is a, a pretty severe diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so we just didn't receive it. But leaving the hospital that night, um, I just cried because I was so tired. And we just knew that this was from the enemy, that God wouldn't give me a baby finally, give us a baby that we had prayed for, and God knit Donnie together in my womb, but God doesn't knit defects. And so we just weren't receiving that. Um, that wasn't something that was going to be, even though it was a reality, we weren't going to let reality dictate who God was. Yeah. 
So there was like a weapon forming against him. And we prayed that it would not prosper. And when we went to the appointment, uh, there was no signs of any heart issues at all. Yeah. So a couple of weeks later, we went to the cardiologist follow up after Donnie was released. And this was the appointment that they were supposed to be able to diagnose officially, whether it was the cardiomyopathy or uh, the defect. And there's nothing wrong with his heart at all. So there's no indication of anything. And there's also no heart murmur. It's so uh, we're just so thankful and God is so good. And uh, we just give all glory and praise to him. So can't wait to see you guys. We love you. Yep. Bye. Woo. Donnie. I love it. At Kate's shower, there was a prophetic word given that Donnie is a warrior. You think he's a warrior? God is faithful. Did you notice in their testimony? that Drew was taking God's word and using it in faith over their son. You don't know what God says unless you're in his word. And I just want to emphasize again how important it is to know his word because this is your weapon of faith. This is what you can speak into situations. And I don't care what the situation is, if it's uh, relational problems, if it's financial problems, if it's uh, emotional trauma, no matter what it is, when you in faith are confident that God says in his word, this has to change. It has to change. So I just feel like this morning, um, Actually, in pre-service prayer, Tom had a sense that God wanted to do an activation. That wasn't where I was going to go. And the Lord said, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> so in faith, <laughs> I'm going to go with what God says. And we're going to do an activation. So, again, I really feel like there are some that are really struggling with disappointment this morning. And I want those who are struggling with disappointment, whether it's been past disappointment or present disappointment, I'm really going to ask you to humble yourself and come up here this morning. And as you come, I'm going to ask those of you who gave a faith testimony to come and impart a new level of faith to them this morning. Because you know what? We're a body here. And like Angie shared, we come alongside each other. And when we don't have the faith, we can partner with someone that has the faith. That's what impartation is all about. And so the Lord wants to, you know what? He's, he's saying not even disappointment. If you want to be operating this morning in the fullness of faith that is talked about in Hebrews, then I want you to come up this morning and we're going to pray for you. You know what? The fullness of faith is already inside of you because Jesus Christ, lives inside of you. It's not something you have to ask for. It's something that's already there. It just needs to be activated. And so this morning, we are going to activate that greater level of faith so that you know that you know that you know faith is operating within you. And you have been called to move mountains. You have been called to speak to situations in your life and say, uh-uh, no more. We're not going to receive this. This is not God's best. This is not what God says. So, ta would you come and help pray? Rochelle, Angie. Um, am I missing? Lisa. And I know that if... Uh, Drew and Kate are listening to this morning. They're extending their faith and partnering with you also this morning. So, um, 
just to individually go along and just impart faith, impart an activation of faith. Like I said, there's already a fullness of faith in you. It just has to be activated. How? No, you can just kind of break, break them up into a couple of people so that everybody gets, um, yeah. How many here have been waiting for years to see signs, miracles, and wonders released? That's what we're talking about. Faith for that, a higher level of faith that we're operating in. And God says, yes, I want to do that this morning. I want to activate that here in this house this morning, in you this morning. And so, Lord, we invite you to come. We invite that activation by your Holy Spirit to come this morning. Activate us, God. And as people who have shared their testimony, just lay hands on the people that have come forward. We are trusting you are going to activate that fullness of faith that resides in us. And that situations are going to shift and change because we are operating out of that fullness of faith. Come, Lord. Just go ahead and lay hands. Lord, we thank you this morning that you have created us as a body to be one. That you have created us as people that will grab the hand of someone else and say, come on, step up, I'm with you. And so we thank you this morning, Lord, for your spirit being so present and for activating the fullness of faith within each and every one of us. And we declare before you this morning, Lord, that we will say yes to it. And we will use it to have you manifest your presence in such a way that your kingdom is on display here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.